Okay, all right. Um, I haven't finished creating the papers, but I'm going to try to have it done soon. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, I think, especially with respect to some of the things we're reading. Yeah, I guess this is a good way to start. Yeah, so especially with respect to some of the stuff we're reading this week, um, but maybe even with respect to the, the great lawsuit as well. Um, um, I think you can imagine treating Fuller in comparison to people like Schelling and Coleridge and Emerson and Nietzsche as just a kind of um, um, like writer of opinion pieces for the newspaper. <laughs> I mean, she was a writer of opinion pieces for the newspaper, or anyway, of some kind of column, right? So like the St. Valentine's Day, and, Fourth of July, that was part of her, I guess it was weekly column. I'm not sure how often she wrote. Um, but um, now, on the other hand, there's other things she writes. And I think that's at least some parts of the great lawsuit are like this. Uh, the Magnolia of Lake Pontchartrain is definitely like this and some of the stuff we're reading for next time are definitely like this for uh oh hello uh, all right um where uh where it seems clear that there's more to her than that Right. I mean, which I think um, uh, makes the question, and I kind of, I, I think I kind of started to raise this question at least implicitly last time, makes the question, why would a philosopher, or at least someone who's at least a philosopher, <laughs> Perhaps something more than a philosopher, or perhaps conceives herself as something more than a philosopher, like a prophet or something, right? But in any case, someone who is at least a philosopher, why are they writing stuff like this for the newspaper? <laughs> I think um, so. Um, I mean, which I guess. Uh, again, is related to these other questions I raised about her last time, or at least like differences between her and Emerson. You know, what is it that makes her seem to endorse particular political positions? Um, uh, what is it that makes her take a different kind of, apparently different kind of attitude towards the actual approachable America <laughs> than Emerson does. Um, the one that has already been discovered, for better or worse. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure I can answer any of these questions, but, I'm, but I am going to talk about things that have to do with them and hopefully get closer. Um, I mean, she's, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that she's easier to understand than Emerson or Nietzsche. I mean, at some point she is, but at some points, uh, like that Magnolia thing, you know, there's a lot of parts where I'm just really not sure what's going on. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, but I want to start with, um, with, I guess, the, the thing 
in this course that I feel most secure in that, you know, somehow there's a demand that the infinite be finitely represented right? so that we can know our own infinite nature. So, you know, the question is what does, you know, how do we imagine that demand being built? So like for shelling, it means that the work of an artistic genius is perfect. Um, it's, uh, I mean, uh, that's why he, he excludes apparently most art from, his, from what he's talking about when he's talking about art. Right, but the work of the artistic genius is is um, uh, is perfect. And if you ask how can a human being create something perfect, the answer is that you remember that it, it it's not the human being in the sense of the conscious self, right? And that's why when you ask the genius afterwards, you know. Uh, how did this come about? They say, well, you know, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's more than I intended, right? So, um, um, so for Coleridge, now, I mean, I think this is something I have to put somewhere in my notes that I have to think about this more carefully when I talk about Coleridge in the first place. Because it's, it's something, and this must have happened two years ago too, based on what my, well, a lot of my notes from two years ago were pretty disorganized. <laughs> so they need a lot of work, but as far as I can tell, uh, you know, I was kind of thought about this later then too, namely that, um, For all the complicated talk about symbols, uh, like words as symbols and so forth in Coleridge, the most important thing must be the incarnation of God as, as Jesus, right? That, um, like, that is the way that the infinite is finitely represented as far as Coleridge is concerned. I, I, I assume now, like, I mean, as I said, I didn't see him talking about that in most of the things we were reading, which makes me think that I need to select different things <laughs> because he must talk about it somewhere. But I mean, we know he, you know, it's because of that that he denies the Unitarianism as Christianity. Because, right, I mean, he has a discussion. He says the problem isn't that they believe in the unity of God, everyone believes in that. <laughs> Yeah, the problem is that they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus, the divinity of Christ, right? So, uh, so you know, as far as Coleridge is concerned, the, the key insight of Christianity is that morality is impossible except through the grace of the perfect human being who actually, you know, comes among us. Um, and us and the sacrifice of the perfect human being. Um, again, like I don't remember the things we were reading and talking that much about uh, atonement. Um, but so in any case, that so so like that's kind of what corresponds to that perfect work of art, right? And it's again, it's possible because of you know, um, again, it's possible because of a, well, yeah, see, this makes it com more complicated. What is the role of that perfect human being in the grace that allows other people to become perfect? Then that could be important for understanding what's happening in color too. All right, but I don't know, so I can't say. <laughs> so, um, but okay, but so for Emerson, 
um, who starts off as a Unitarian and then moves, so to speak, farther to the left, you know, I mean, in some sense, right, like farther, farther away from established religion, uh, you know, um, the point is that everyone as an individual Um, I guess one way of putting it would be to say everyone as an individual has to be their own Christ. They, I mean, at least that's one way of understanding that thing from uh, experience, yet is the God the native of these bleak rocks. Um, As I'm saying these things, I'm all, um, so there's a sacrifice. It's the God that, yeah, it's the God that made up these big rocks. I remember the exact context of that. Um, I can't find it now. Um, okay, I don't know. That's something that has to be worked out later. But so anyway, so 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 I guess you know, like now the demand is that each of us has to, you know, be like make ourselves into this perfect work of art, so to speak. Again, it involves some kind of sacrifice. That's that's the thing that I'm trying to reconstruct why. But um, So, I mean, how does this work out in Fuller? Well, you know, I mean, Fuller obviously is in some way close to Emerson. That's why she's emphasizing this text, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Um, but the question is what that means for Fuller. Um, and Last time I talked about the different way idealism comes out in her, right? So it comes out, I mean, take my, my one picture <laughs> again, with the idea that um, the alienness of the world is really due to my own self imposed limitation. Um, so the world, if the world means whatever like resists me as a subject, the world is my creation. But um, but what that comes out to mean in Fuller is that um, the sense in which it's my own creation is that if I don't have what I want. It's because I haven't understood what I really want yet. So, um, so we're not talking about, I mean, in Schelling, I think we are literally talking about this, about like that somehow behind my back, I'm actually creating this like table or whatever. <laughs> Right. So, and remember, he says that that if you know, like to follow through the the um, um, to follow through completely the way the 
um, the realist prejudice, prejudice gets overturned in favor of idealism, we would have to examine every single detail of the world down to its smaller, smallest parts. <laughs> right? Because, because we're trying, you know, he's he's understanding this limit here as the the worldness of the world, so to speak, you know, consists in what? Well, it consists in like its empirical character. The fact that I have to wait passively for it to affect me. Um, so, uh, um, um, so it's it, it's intrinsically a limit to me because it's um, it's intrinsically something that happens to me. Right, and so you know, so to explain that that's really due to me, you have to explain how everything that happens to me was really me. <laughs> now, um, but Fuller, but Fuller isn't really talking about. I mean, I don't. I feel like she's not saying anything about this either way. About like where did this table come from? Right, like she's. <laughs> You know what makes the world a world is the fact that I'm um, that it's disappointing. <laughs> That's what makes it like not me <laughs> or resistant to me is the fact that it's disappointing. Um, so this, first of all, is interesting because. Uh, the person who's coming to speak in our colloquium series at the end of this quarter, Ray Tarada, I don't know how to pronounce her first name, uh, but uh, yeah, she um, has an interpretation of Kant, which is really interesting, which emphasizes the, what Kant says about our, like, kind of our emotional relationship to nature as a whole, that we're we're dissatisfied with it, and then he wants to show us how to be satisfied with it. Um, but so, in any case, um, it, it, it suggests that Fuller might be that kind of Kantian in some way. But so, um, so the um, so the alienness of the world, so to speak, consists in its disappointingness. Um, now, um, there's certainly disappointment is certainly a theme in at least a lot of the stuff that we read for today. Um, in particular, in the Magnolia thing, you know, so the narrator, who is apparently is a man, at least the orange tree says man. Calls him man, right? Again, maybe there's an ambiguity. Uh, like the orange tree would, would call a woman man too, because well, I mean, it's the magnolia tree that used to be an orange tree. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'm kind of assuming that you, you read this and you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, okay. So, right, so the magnolia tree that used to be an orange tree, maybe, you know, because it's a tree, you say, yeah, it's like, we all look, we're all the same species, you know, like so the the tree is using man to mean human being because the difference between men and women does not concern it. Although actually I shouldn't say that because it's the tree itself that brings in that thing. This but this is getting well beyond anything I feel like I understand in that piece. The tree, you know, after the orange tree dies. It goes to meet the the queen of flowers, <laughs> right? Like the supernatural being, and uh, and she says, you know, of course, like all such powers, she is feminine. There's only one paternal power, meaning God, presumably, right? 
so that your, you know, as your father in heaven is perfect, right? So, um, so I guess, yeah, I can't say that. The, the tree is very much thinking of everything in terms of masculine versus feminine. I don't know if oranges or magnolias are the kinds of trees. You know, <clears throat> some trees have individuals of different genders and others don't. I have no idea what the oranges or magnolias are. Magnolias are surely not. Okay. They're not. All right. So we're not supposed to take this literally. But the magnolia is, you know, the magnolia is, is definitely a her, according to the narrator, and the narrator is a man, according to the manual. All right, so, um, um, which, I mean, why that is, again, I'm not sure what to say about it. Um, it's obviously, like, deliberate, you know, um, but uh, it at least shows that, um, There can't be a straightforward equivalence between the narrator and Fuller. There still could, still could be an equivalence, but it wouldn't be straightforward, I guess, you know. So, um, all right, so anyway, the narrator knew the orange tree in, quote, the saddest season of my youth. So why was this season of his youth sad? And apparently, I mean, he doesn't say why he was sad. And obviously, you can imagine all kinds of different reasons someone could be sad. But based on the way they discuss it, um, so he says, um, Thou knowest that even then, had I asked any part of thy dower, it would have been to bear the sweet fruit rather than the sweeter blossoms. My wish had been expressed by another, and I didn't find a source for this, but, oh, that I were an orange tree, that busy plant, then should I ever laden be and never want some fruit from him that dresseth me, for him that dresseth me. So he was, um, thou didst seem to me the happiest of all spirits in wealth of nature and fullness of utterance. And the, the tree says, how is it, man, that thou art now content that thy life bear, bears no gold? So it seems like what man was was disappointed with before was that his life bore no golden fruit. And the golden fruit is a kind of utterance. We, like, in fact, the tree keeps calling, producing oranges, speaking. <laughs> right? Like after the, the freeze comes, she says, um, I tried to speak, meaning she tried to produce oranges, but nothing came out, right? So uh, um, so it seems like um The man was sad because of some kind of like artistic frustration, inability to 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 produce the kind of golden utterance that he wanted to. Um, I mean, that's you know, um, that's not the first thing that would occur to that would would occur to me anyway, if someone said that was the saddest season of my youth, I would think, oh, you know, frustrated in love, or, you know, someone died or whatever. But it, I think if you read this carefully, it's like, no, he was, that was the saddest season of his youth because he wanted to produce some kind of utterance, but he couldn't. And now he's content. And why is he content? He says, because um, unable to find myself in other forms of nature, I was driven back upon the center of my being and there found all being. And the magnolia replies, because he, right, he asked, 
he said, if you were so happy and whatever, why, why am I now finding you in, without fruit? And the Magnolia tree says, you know, oh, for similar reasons, I'm trying to simplify my being. <laughs> um, so, um, unable to find myself in other forms of nature. Now, you know, like, so to, to find myself in other forms of nature, I guess, the idea, I mean, I'm not sure this is right at all, but it's something like the man in his youth was trying to take the shelling route, <laughs> right? Like the man in his youth was trying to, um, um, produce some kind of, I mean, I'm assuming it's an artistic utterance. I don't know why I necessarily assume that. You know, maybe he's trying to publish philosophy papers and he can't get published, and that's why he's sad. I, that's something that makes me sad, but, but it doesn't, somehow it doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so yeah, I assume it's some kind of artistic utterance that he's trying to produce, and he's trying to produce it as a way of, or as a result of finding himself in the forms of nature. So he's trying to do, or, I don't know, if you could say it's Schelling or Emerson, or are they the same in this respect? They, but anyway, you know, he's trying to um, be this kind of poet that, um, um, that recognizes himself in nature and thereby is able to produce this um, um, artistic product that, that, that shows how nature is really the manifestation of my own infinite self, right? And that, um, so, uh, but he was disappointed. He wasn't able to do that. But now he's content. He's content because he realized he didn't need that. And the orange tree also, I mean, if anything, you might think that if, if someone in this story represents Fuller, you might think it was the orange tree. But I'm not sure how that would work either. But in any case, the orange tree, like, I mean, kind of takes the opposite path to the same end, right? Like the orange tree was able to produce all this stuff, but found that it, it, she was made miserable by it rather than happy. So that even though, I guess you could say, even though she's overcoming this limit in the way Schelling and maybe the way Emerson think of it, she wasn't overcoming the limit the way full of things of it, right? She was um, increasing her feeling that the world wasn't adapted to her in the process of, of finding herself in this sense. So, um, so it seems like it seems here like the difference is that the demand to be perfect is going to be met by um, withdrawing, not looking for yourself where you're not. Um, so, I mean, it would be really easy if I could stop there and say, and this is what Fuller thinks, right? But there's all kinds of stuff that goes in other directions. So, uh, you know, so like in the 4th of July, for example, the 4th of July is also all about disappointment. So um, it's our disappointment for one thing. And I think, you know, so she, uh, in these pieces, she always uses the editorial we, <laughs> right? It's just like we spent St. Valentine's Day in the insane asylum. It doesn't mean me and someone else, it just means her, right? So, um, so it's our disappointment, you know, 
it's not clear. I think it's ambiguous whether that's the editorial we or a real we. <laughs> um, I mean, there's similar use of we in Nietzsche a lot of times. Where he's, you know, he says, you know, but we have no need for this, right? And you're not sure if it means him or him and someone else or him and you or. Right? So, but anyway, so it's our disappointment. I mean, I, I think that ambiguity is important because the question is, is this an individual's disappointment or is this the nation's own disappointment with itself? Right? I mean, but it's, there's also, on the other hand, the world is disappointed with America, right? The world placed their hopes in America, but now they see that that wasn't justified. Um, why, there's something about this year, 1845, that she, where she feels it's particularly bad. And uh, I'm not sure this is right, but I think she's probably alluding to the decision to let Texas enter the Union as a slave state. That was kind of a like watershed moment, and that happened in 1845. But you know, whatever the details, it's. I mean, it's interesting to that she puts it that way because I think um, it shows that um, at the founding of the Union, a lot of people thought that slavery was on its way out. Obviously, others, others did not, <laughs> right? But a lot of people thought slavery was on its way out, and you know it's unfortunate, but it's just temporary. Um, and as things went farther and farther in the early 19th century, it became clear that it was not on its way out. It was digging in its heels and expanding. Um, so anyway, so, so that's what's evoking this sense of disappointment. Um, and it's true that in that essay also, at first she seems to be counseling withdrawal, right? So, you know, she says, if nations go astray, the narrow path may always be found and followed by the individual man. And this, I don't know if it makes sense to get page numbers here. But this, this, uh, I probably should have somehow put my own pages in the PDF. Oh, no, actually, I think I didn't even put up a PDF of this, did I? I just went to, yeah, so there's no way to put my own pages on it. Anyway, this is on page 233. Um, and, you know, and she concludes, it is not easy. It is very hard just now to realize the blessings of independence. So, you know, it's difficult. Struggling, panting, he must fix his eyes upon his aim and fight against the current to reach it. But it is possible, and that's what at first seems she's saying how we should react to this hopeless situation where the where everyone has just decided to let Texas in to the union. Let's say it's that or some other development like that, you know, where it's like, you know, clearly the political situation is hopeless and the and so you know what should you do well um you can still celebrate independence day it's just hard because it has to be your independence right and as she says a little bit uh later on the genuine independence independence of wrong of violence of falsehood <laughs> Right? That's the Independence Day that you can still celebrate as an individual, although it's not going to be easy. Um, um, but as you go further on from that, um, I guess at the bottom of page 230, bottom of page 233, there's a new paragraph that starts. Yet there remains a great and worthy part to play. And then she starts saying how um, um, 
if people, if, if a few, and she doesn't say people, she says men, <laughs> if a few men uh, manage to celebrate this true independence, they actually could be sufficient to lead the country, to lead the nation to the true independence. Um, a few men are wanted, able to think and act upon principles of an eternal value. Um, later, she actually talks about fathers and brothers. Um, yeah, at the top of page 235. We know not where to look for an example of all or many of the virtues we would seek from the man who is to begin the new dynasty that is needed of fathers of the country. She needs fathers good at the of the country is she, but she needs fathers good enough to be godfathers, men who will stand sponsors at the baptism with all they possess, etc. All right, so. Um, um, so it turns out that um, she's not just counseling withdrawal. I mean, that's like a strategy, basically, right? But it's not on the route. To, it's not on the road to becoming content with the existence of slavery. Let's say it's not me. Um, I mean, remember, at some point, Emerson. Um, seem to say something like that, that, I mean, not in the sense of being content with it, but like that it's, I should be perfecting myself, not worrying about these um, uh, black people a thousand miles away. Um, but that's certainly not what she's saying. So, um, um, so there seems to be a, a conflict between two different ways she's looking at how, right, how to approach this disappointment, which makes the world alien to me. Um, now, um, I'm not sure exactly how to resolve that, or if I can resolve it, <laughs> um, but uh, it, I think it's connected to that other stuff I was talking about at the beginning, right? Like why she is um, involved in national politics in a way that Emerson mostly is not. So Emerson did eventually, you know, give lectures on uh, promoting abolitionism. It took him a lot of people feel like too long to do that. <laughs> Um, we know from his journals that, I mean, it's not like he used to think slavery was okay and then he changed his mind, but it seems like maybe something actually convinced him to, to speak about it on a public stage, which before he didn't, wouldn't have thought he should do. Uh, but in any case, um, um, but I, like, is this true? I'm going to say I can't imagine Emerson writing a weekly column for the New York Times. Um, he did give public lectures. It was kind of an lecture circuit. <laughs> it was not that different. I don't know. Um, well, okay, I'm sorry. You know, it's, I know it's probably, it's not good that everything I say about this, I then say, well, I'm not sure that's true, but. <laughs> But it's the nature of the material. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, I guess I want to say I'm sure there's some kind of difference between them in that respect. I'm just not sure I know how to say it. Right. <laughs> so, but in any case, like, and and maybe the way to say it right is that um, from Fuller's point of view. It's not only the individual, but also the nation that is a kind of finite incarnation of the infinite. Now, um, 
as soon as you say that, you have to ask, well, what, wait, what is a nation exactly? <laughs> um, and uh, um, I don't know anything positive she says about that. I know thing. I know some responses of that could be ruled out, right? Because like you talk, she talks about the American nation and how it has to find its own true nature and whatever. She says, um, you know, we're different because uh, so many different kinds of people have come together. So uh, a nation, and and they have to form a nation. Right, so in other words, she's not thinking of a nation as a kind of quasi-genetic entity, like all descendants of the same people. Um, um, but that obviously raises the question about how are you thinking of it? You know, is it like, so, you know, like when Rousseau talks about this, he says, uh, uh, yeah, okay, the, the people have to choose how to govern themselves, but first they have to become a people. How do they do that? <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, well, I guess you could say she does have an answer to that. Yeah, maybe I'll come back and say what maybe her answer to that is, but it's a strange answer. Because you might think, and this is what Rousseau, Rousseau thinks, that whatever that is, it has to happen before any other things, like setting up political institutions and whatever. But Fuller seems to think it happens afterwards. <laughs> so anyway, um, so And I guess, well, so when I say not only the individual, but also the nation, obviously it can't be that, it's not that simple because the nation is like composed of individuals somehow. So, uh, this is a new picture. I don't, I don't know if it has anything that's different from the other picture. <laughs> the nation is composed of individuals. So the question is um, like, uh, how is the self-perfection or self-realization of the individuals related to the self-perfection or self-realization of the nation? And I think, I mean, it's, I guess, yeah, I guess you say the reason I drew this picture is, I mean, maybe I shouldn't even draw this line, right? Like, this is the nation, there's no one in it but individuals. So like, it's not plausible to say that these are just two totally independent issues. <laughs> that yeah, all the people could become perfect and the nation not be, or vice versa. Um, um, so I think like, Something simple you might think along these lines would be to say that, um, well, the individuals are men, and then, but the nation represents man. So, right, then you would be saying that the nation represents the infinite and the individuals represent the finite. Now, I mean, like, um, there's some points in Hegel where that's true in the phenomenology of spirit, let's say. Um, or even in the philosophy of right or places like that, maybe in a fuller sense or a, a deeper sense that that's true. But um, um, But I think even in Hegel and definitely in Fuller, you can't you can't simply identify them that way, right? That is, I mean, it's 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 not clear at all which 
of these things represents man and which represents man. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, from Fuller's point of view, and this is maybe not that different from what Hegel ultimately would say, it's like, it depends what, you know, how you're looking at it or what stage you're looking at it or something, you know, or like that is that the nation can represent man to the individual or can the nation raise the other way. The, the nation can represent men to the individual who's trying to stand for man. But on the other hand, the individuals can represent men to the nation in its attempt to stand for man. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's something, I think it's something like that, and I, and I think that's why, you know, there's a lot of places where she seems to go back and forth quickly between individuals and nations. Um, um, right, so like in the American literature, Piece. And, you know, I only signed the beginning of this because the rest of it is all discussions of individual 19th century American authors and whatever. I didn't think it was that, that useful. But, um, um, that's the quote I'm looking for. It's, it's at the bottom of 122, in fact, it's 123. So, right, she talks about when, uh, in childhood, she had well nigh forgotten her English while constantly reading in other languages. She knew a lot of other languages, even in her childhood. As I said, she was a child prodigy. So, so I mean, like she was teaching Greek to other people. And <laughs> she, anyway, uh, but here, I guess she's talking about, about Italy, Spain, and France, the Latins, as she calls them, right? So she says, um, although first she says continental Europe, which would include Germany, but then she calls them the Latins, which would not include Germany. I don't know. Anyway, still, what we loved in the literature of continental Europe was the range and force of ideal manifestation in forms, in forms of national and individual greatness. Um, and a little bit farther down, the stamp both of nationality and individuality was very strong upon them. Um, right, and as she goes on in this essay, she says that, uh, well, and not only in this essay, I guess, in other pieces too, she says that, uh, um, development of great individuals is dependent on national development, right? So the American literature thinks she's saying that, um, you know, her, her position here is that we don't yet have great, um, or don't really have American literature at all yet. <laughs> yeah. um, and the reason is because the nation isn't sufficiently developed. So there isn't something that, there isn't a national character for the great writers to represent. Um, you know, uh, um, So, uh, I'm not sure when Leaves of Grass was published. I don't think she discusses Whitman in this essay. I mean, you know, that was an example of someone who, who would have disagreed with her about that. They <laughs> thought there was something to express and, you know, and at least according, so I think Emerson first had a positive reaction to Whitman, but then kind of distanced himself from it. I don't know anything about Fuller and Whitman. But okay, so, but in any case, I, you know, like whether, 
whether she's right or not about the particular stage that America is at in 18, I think this is also 1845 or around there. Um, she, uh, the, the idea is that individual development requires national development. Um, and you know, similarly, when she talks about the rich man, especially this is this comes up especially in the case of the rich man. The poor man is a little bit different. But the rich man, she says, you know, at the beginning, look, uh, it's not really possible for someone to lead an exemplary life because of the way our society is. But you know, you could at least live, imagine someone living in a way that's not unworthy. <laughs> Right. So, um, so, but again, the implication is that for someone to really lead a decentralized life, the nation would have to be reformed. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be self reliant and that we should wait. The individual should wait on the nation's development. Um, so again, remember in the Fourth of July, she says that first she says if nations go astray, the narrow path may always be found and followed by individual man. She said the use of man, so the individual man. If you're really an individual, then you're man, not man. <laughs> I think it might be one way. I mean, I don't know, man is reading too much into it. Obviously, it's not part of the same book and everything. But, um, and uh, she actually says something stronger than that there. This is on page 234 in the Fourth of July essay. Um, if that country has so widely veered from the course she prescribed to herself and that the hope of the world prescribed to her, it must be because she had not men ripened and confirmed for better things. They leaned too carelessly on one another. They had not deepened and purified the private lives from which the public vitality must spring, as the verdure of the plain from the fountains of the hills. I don't understand what that metaphor is doing, but anyway. <laughs> um, um, but before you get to that metaphor, right, she's saying that the reason the nation hasn't gone in the right direction is because the individuals were leaning on each other. That is, were, you know, were, were relying on the nation for their development rather than, um, um, they, rather than deepening and purifying the private lives from which the public vitality must spring. Um, so, um, so when we say that both the individual and the nation are, are confronted with this um, task of what of, of like um, perfecting themselves by learning what it is they should really want, and and I think I mean right so when she talks about na national development uh, it's in contrast to the type of the development that they orator she imagines at the beginning of the piece right who's going to say how america has expanded more wealthy and secure and whatever but that's not what she's interested in in fact national development would be developed in the direction of realizing that that's not what's important so um um 
Um, so if we say that both the individual and the nation are, are faced with this task and that they somehow have to do it together, it's um, like each one of them has to rely only on itself and yet it can't succeed without the other cooperative. Um, because each one is, so to speak, a precondition for the other. <laughs> um, maybe that's somehow similar to what Schelling says in the practical philosophy, but I'm not sure how to take it any farther than that. Okay, so I mean, how does Fuller think this works? And so one reason I wanted, I, I started the reading with the Valentine's Day essay is that it seems like what she says there about the so-called insane or the people we regard as insane is somehow crucial to how she looks at all these other things. So what is wrong with the so-called insane according to her? Now, I mean, Is this right? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but, um, but this is how she describes them. Those too deeply, this is on page 227, those too deeply wounded or disturbed in body or spirit to keep up that semblance or degree of sanity which the conduct of affairs in the world at large demands. So in other words, the difference between the insane and us, which is um, in the context of coming to the Valentine's Day dance, we're described as the world's people. Right? She says like a few select of the world's people were invited to attend. So like um, the difference between the insane and the world's people is that the world's people are busily pretending to be sane. <laughs> and the insane are just people who like for one reason or another have not been able to keep up the pretense. <laughs> um, um so i mean first of all if you look at it that way um you uh, might start thinking that the only way to help would be through insanity <laughs> right that that like um you have to first stop pretending to be sane before you can be cured, right? I mean, that's kind of Socrates' diagnosis of the right? like, um, um, that's why he, Socrates tries to, well, at least there's one interpretation, that's why Socrates tried to reduce us to the state of aporia, which, you know, um, Could be understood. I mean, it's it's an inability to say anything about something that we're perfectly familiar with. A kind of insane state, basically, right? You know, but Socrates says, well, you know, that's necessary because the first step towards knowledge would be realizing that you don't already know. <laughs> um, so um and actually, he demonstrates that using a slave. Oh. Okay. I don't know what to do with that now. I'll apply that for future reference. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, <clears throat> it, with, with, with Socrates also, this is somehow tied to the question of how to react to the fact that there are slaves. Um, Okay, but in any case, um, so 
Um, yeah, it might seem that um, that what we take for help is, um, is a kind of what she calls mania. Socrates also described philosophy as a form of sometimes a form of meaning. Uh, well, anyway, and Plato is supposed to have described Diogenes the Cynic as Socrates Minominus, like maniac Socrates. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. Um, so, uh, um, so what I was going to read here, this is also on page 227. Um, right, she quotes, apparently this quote is from uh, Emerson's older brother, Charles, one of the noblest youths that ever trod this soil, was wanted to say, he was never tired if he could only see far enough. He is now gone where his view may be less bounded. But we, right, that's because Emerson's brother died in the 1830s, I guess. Anyway, he is now gone where his view may be less bounded. But we, who stay behind, may take the hint that mania, no less than the commonest forms of prejudice, he speaks a mind which does not see far enough to correct partial impressions. What does this have to do with being tired? Okay. Anyway, I understand that part. Mania, no less than the commonest forms of prejudice, he speaks a mind which does not see far enough to correct partial impressions. So the idea is that I guess Mania, in a tactical sense here, is like some kind of, uh, you know, well, I guess what we still call a manic state, you know, so it's like we have delusions of grandeur or, or something like that, right? So it's like um, the, the problem is that you don't see far enough to see all sides of the question, so to speak. So like you see the part of you that appears to yourself as great, but you're unable to see far enough to put that in context where, you know, and compare yourself to, to other people and realize that, you know, uh, you're no greater than they are or whatever. I, I mean, I, I think it's something like that is what she's saying. And it's, um, but when she says no less than the commonest forms of prejudice, Right, so the idea is that being prejudiced against a certain person or certain people is, has the same structure as mania. You're not seeing both sides of the question, something like that. So, I mean, in particular, uh, one prejudice we have is um, the prejudice against the insane. <laughs> right? This is, we don't see, as she puts it on the next page, that um, uh, says, the power which shall yet shape order from all disorder and turn ashes to beauty as violets spring up from green graves. Again, I don't know. Well, I don't know. As violets spring up from green graves, half them also in its keeping. Right? So um, we don't, um, we think of them as, we dismiss them as people who we don't have anything to learn from because they've been uh, like excluded from this task. Right, like they, 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 we, we think of them as no longer representing the power of the capital P. 
that will yet reduce all to order to a disorder to order or, or whatever she said there. Um, shape order from all disorder. Um, that um, um, and so uh, we don't really see them. We don't see all sides of them. We don't see far enough. And then the problem is, that's why we haven't seen ourselves. <laughs> Right? I mean, that is, so it is, that is our belief that we're, we are sane is a delusion of grandeur. <laughs> That's the same source as, as the people that we treat as manic, right? That is, we, um, we think we don't have their problem. Um, and so we don't learn from them that we're, no, we're in that same situation. We need to be cured as much as they do. And any, in some sense, they're farther along than we are. Um, so, um, So the cure for us, you know, the cure for us is to start learning from them, <laughs> right? There's the cure for us is to learn from, the, from their folly. So, um, Right, so like she introduces this um, by contrast with something that a companion of hers said. A companion of that delicate nature by which a scar is felt as a wound. Again, I don't know why she adds that there. Was saddened by the thought how very little our partialities, undue emotions, and manias need to be exaggerated to entitle us to rank among madmen. Right? So her companion was, you know, her companion, I guess, viewing the same uh, Valentine's Day dance as her. I don't know if her companion was there or she told her companion about it or anyway, like, took the moral, oh, wow, so, you know, these people are actually not as different from us as as we thought, um, um, it would only take a little bit for us to be just as crazy as they are. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's kind of what Locke says about this. But I'm not sure if he makes the same moral as a companion did. Yeah. Is it maybe because the insane don't have uh, illusions about what they want. So they actually figure it out the way that we don't yet. Well, I mean, they do have illusions of what they want, about what they want, along with all the other illusions. I think, and 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 moreover, it's you know when she describes they where they were at the dance, she makes it clear that you know part of the point is, that, and this is what her companion is reacting to. I think they weren't really all that different from us, right? So you know, like you know the way she says how like all the types you might find at a at a 
same party were there. There was the British traveler, and there was the you know whatever. Um, so, uh, but I think yeah, they're closer. Um, at least if they're properly governed, as they are by Dr. Oral, <laughs> um, they 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 can be closer than we are. Um, because, um, um, because at least they don't have to deal with the delusion that, um, um, that there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, and in that sense, I guess you could say it's right that they know more about what they really want. Um, again, like, I mean, for Socrates, why does Socrates keep coming up all of a sudden? Uh, I don't know, probably just, uh, probably just got on my brain and it's coming up, but, but maybe not, maybe there's something to this, but, you know, um, for Socrates, those two things are tightly related. All point is, like, you know, uh, if you know something to be good, and it is close to what Fuller is saying, if you know something to be good, then uh, you will want it. And then, but, you know, so, so, uh, like, evil is ignorance, you know. So, so like, so, so you kind of, it sounds weird because you don't stop to think what Socrates believes you actually would want if you knew, <laughs> right? Like just like Fuller, he, you know, it, if you knew, you would realize that what you really want is self knowledge. Or something. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, and it's, it's it's something that by wanting it, you would have it. <laughs> Just as Fuller keeps saying, right? Once the soul knows what it wants, it has it. Um, so yeah, so I guess, yeah, I think they're closer to that. I think that's right. Um, but you know, that suggests getting back to this issue of the individuals versus the nation that um That, you know, so part of what was kind of paradoxical about the way I was talking about this before was that we were thinking that the, and she did seem to be saying this in the 4th of July piece, that like how can individuals contribute to the national development? Well, by being healthy, by being perfect. Right, and then the nation would learn from them. That's what she says there. And similarly, I guess you would say, how could the nation contribute to individual development? Well, you know, so like currently it's hard because you have to fight against the, the folly of the nation, right? But if the nation were, were perfect, you would be able to learn just by looking around you how, how to live correctly. So, um, but this um, Valentine's Day piece suggests that there's another side to the story. And, and it, that's kind of paradoxical because it seems like, you know, so which comes first? Like you need one. But the Valentine's Day piece suggests that, um, that actually there's a way it could work the opposite, that the folly of the nation that learning to um, see yourself in the folly of the nation would be um, a path towards indiv individual development. Just as she's saying that learning to see yourself in the insane is a path towards mental health. <laughs> um, that um, 
that uh, so like what should you what should be the reaction to the fact that the nation is committed to slavery and war well um, um, like how how can you overcome the, the disappointment in the sense that it's this makes it impossible for you to perfect yourself well you, you know you have to recognize first of all that um, um, that kind of insanity that you're seeing in the nation as a whole is present in you too. Yeah. So we couldn't be making the... Uh, so that uh, the normality in comparison to the insane asylum is somehow a faulty concept and then we try to apply or they try to apply that concept to the nation and that's why it's, it can't be it can't uh, like develop to to a healthier communication yeah i mean So I mean, put it this way. I, I, I mean, it's not, it's not a well. I mean, there's something faulty about it. <laughs> it's not a faulty concept in the sense that there's no difference between the people inside the cell and the people outside, or something like that. Um, but there's a faulty understanding of what, when we stand outside, what our relation is to those people inside, and you know. Um, uh, that so the companion's reaction is fear that I could end up inside, basically. Um, whereas her reaction is um, uh, hope at realizing that. Um, that these people inside have something to teach me to make me better than just outside, <laughs> right? And, um, uh, and in part because they're already somewhat better than outside, right? So, um, so, you know, so when you look at America, like, I mean, you know, so that description she gives of the people in the asylum too deeply wounded or disturbed in body or spirit to keep up that semblance or degree, of, or degree of sanity which the conduct of affairs in the world at large demands. Like that, that description could definitely be applied to America in the 1840s, <laughs> right? Like it's wounded, um, it's falling apart, you know, um, it's, uh, um, unable to take simple steps like setting up a territorial government in Kansas and Nebraska because this, the, the, um, each side is afraid it will disturb the equilibrium between slave states and free states, right? It's, it's, um, but it's wounded, so it's wounded in body, so to speak, but it's even more wounded in spirit because the wounded spirit is slavery itself, I think, from our point of view, right? So, like, um, and so it's, you know, um, I think, um, first of all, that's how you have to look at, you know, when she keeps saying how this is, dis this is disappointing the hope of the world. 
world or like um, um, it's the what is she saying that in the great lawsuit it's the scoff of the nations or something like that right I I don't I think um, she's saying that not so much in the sense of hey you should be worried about this because it's you know like uh, having a negative impact on America's image overseas, <laughs> right? It's she's she's pointing out that we must be wounded because we're not able to pretend to be respectable. <laughs> uh, yeah. But like, wouldn't that mess up the the metaphor? Because then <laughs> in America, it was a bit like. And then you see this silent, I guess, as a bit more ahead, whereas they were saying that they're not. Well, I think, no, I mean, I mean, remember, like part of it, what's hard to understand about her compared to Emerson or Thoreau is the way Emerson or Thoreau seem to be willing to, uh, to uh, like detach the metaphorical or ideal America from the real America and say, you know, the real America has yet to be discovered. Or there's a, that quote I had from Thoreau where he says like the true America, the only true America is the place where you're not compelled to pay for slavery and, and war, right? So, um, but you know, what's in contrast, Fuller seems to, yes, she says that um, um, there's something corrupt in that whole project of America to begin with, and especially in the way it's developed, the slavery and whatever. Um, but at the same time, you know, she turns around and says that, like, this is a favorable time and place. Right, it still means something that these words have been said. All men are created equal, whatever. Right, so um, so yeah, I think she does have a sense that, um, and I think that's why I say I think the St. Valentine's Day essay can be crucial to understanding what's going on in the whole thing. That that if you say, well, you know, which is it? Is is America like just? Um, um, like to be treated as insane, <laughs> um, or is America in some way in advance of other places, in some way uh, appropriate place to, to, to put your hopes, um, something that we as individuals and other nations could learn from, and the answer is, well, it's both, because you, you, you don't realize how you should treat the insane. <laughs> That's, um, now, I mean, and I'm like, I don't think it's so far-fetched to connect these two things, because she does connect at the end of the essay. Right, on page 231, we know no sign of the times more encouraging than the increasing nobleness and wisdom of view as to the government of asylums for the insane and of prisons. So unfortunately, we can't say this <laughs> anymore. It was true then, I think, but in between other things have happened. Anyway, um, so, Whatever is learned as to these forms of as to these forms of society is learned for all. There is nothing that can be said of such government that must not be said also of the government of families, schools, and states. But we have much to say on this subject and shall revert to it again and often, though perhaps not with so pleasing a theme as this of St. Valentine's Eve. Right? So she's saying that. Um, like if you want, if the question is, what is the modern humane way of treating an insane nation? 
the answer is same. <laughs> now, like, um, which I think it applies, as I was saying, both to the idea that, you know, the right attitude of the other nations of the world and of, you know, us, whether that means just Fuller or all of us or something, right? But we individuals who are looking on on this, the right attitude is not like, um, okay, well, I hope I don't end up like that. The right attitude is uh, to understand um, um, why the rest of us are, have that problem too. It's just that we're not so wounded that we're not able to keep up a pretense, right? So, um, but also somehow I think this, uh, this, this, so in that sense, it's the same, but, it, but it's the same also in the sense of like, what is the proper exercise of power for governing nations like this? Um, and, um, So going back to page 227 in the, oh, right, the beginning of the Valentine's Day. Um, by the way, I don't know if you noticed her little dig at college students here, but <laughs> it says that the, these insane people, uh, paid as close attention as an audience of regular students, and then in parentheses, not college students, but real students. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by real students, though, but okay. Um, um, for it is our experience that such sickness arises as often from want of concentration as any other cause. That's what comes right before the, the quote from Charles Emerson and the rest of that stuff. So the want of concentration, um, I mean, it's weird because, it, because it's a sudden shift in metaphor between that sentence and the next one. That concentration means, well, concentration literally means, right, that, like circling around the center. But I guess the, the metaphor of mental concentration is that you're like not being distracted, but are directing all your attention into the center. Um, which is just what the man said he learned to do. It's the man told the magnolia he learned to do is to center himself. Uh, and it's also what the flower spirit told the magnolia or the former orange tree that she couldn't do right away. Um, she said, the vehemence of thy desire at once promises and forbids its gratification. Thou wert the keystone of the arch and bound together the circling year. Thou canst not at once become the base of the arch, the center of the circle. Take a step inward, forget a voice, lose a power. Right? So that's why the, the, you know, instead of becoming right away a plant with no fruit or flowers, the, the flower spirit says you have to take a step inward, you give up the fruit, but you're still going to have flowers. But right, so it's the same metaphor of concentration. 
um, which Emerson also talks about a lot. Uh, I mean, there's an essay called Circles, which is all about this thing you didn't read. Um, so, um, so, you know, and then in the next sentence, it's, it switches to seeing far enough. It seems like it's going the other way, right? Like, like in other words, is the sickness caused by being distracted or, or is and distracted actually can be a synonym for insane. Is the sickness caused by being distracted or is the sickness caused by being obsessed? Um, so, um, I don't know exactly how to, I mean, obviously those two metaphors are supposed to come to the same things. They come right after each other that way, I think, but, um, um, even though they, it seems like different diagnoses, um, um, but be that as it may, sticking with the concentration one for the moment, like what is it that how how does Dr. Earl's care for the insane help with the lack of concentration? So you know um, what he does is. Um, Um, this is been a little bit farther down on 227. Dr. Earl, in addition to modes of turning the attention from causes of morbid irritation and promoting brighter and juster thoughts, which he uses in common with other institutions, has this winter delivered a course of lectures to the patients. Um, And at the end of the paragraph, no doubt in many cases, dissipation of thought after attention is most distorted into some morbid direction, maybe the first method of cure. We were glad to see others provided for those who are ready for them. So yeah, I mean, so actually somehow she's talking about the conflict between these two metaphors or two diagnoses of illness and, and treating them as different stages or something. I don't know. I don't know if you can explain what she says about Charles Emerson that way. So I don't know. But anyway, um, so that right, she's saying that the common way that people try to treat this type of mental illness is to like provide entertainments that will distract people from their morbid thoughts. I, I don't guess that that's probably very effective. I don't know. Maybe some ways it's up to you. But anyway, that's the um, that's the common way of approaching it. Um, and she says, no doubt, you know, in some cases, at least at first, that's what's necessary: dissipation of thought. Don't let them think for a long time about the same thing. That would be the opposite of concentration. But um, she's saying that at least in many cases, uh, the ultimate cause is the lack of concentration. And therefore, what Dr. Earl is doing for the patients who are ready for it is delivering these lectures to try to get them to think about one thing carefully. So, right, so it's the opposite of dissipation of thought. Um, um, so when you when you take that course of treatment and apply it to the nation, it suggests that the, the thing about having an American literature is, um, I mean, as she says, she's not into this for, she says, I'm not into this for national pride and like someone can brag about having a great literature. It's essential to a nation to have a literature. We need it. Right, yeah, I, I think is what she's saying, and you, and and she's, I think she's claiming that that's that's the proper government of nations, <laughs> right? Like that's the proper exercise of power over nations. Um, so in other words, um, now I mean, you could interpret this to mean. 
the government should support poets. And maybe she does think that, right? Like she talks about how it's hard for poets to support themselves. And, you know, maybe they should have NEH grants or whatever. But um, but I think uh, a better way of putting, you know, so it is maybe she thinks that would be a good idea, but um, but I think more importantly, she thinks that like the poets are actually exercising the most important functions of government. <laughs> what we call the government is is secondary. Right. So like I mean, the role of what we call the government is made mostly to prevent violence, or at least it's legitimate violence, let's say. I mean, because some it doesn't always do that, of course. You know, like obviously maintaining this slave system and not preventing violence, fostering violence, right? But but I, like you might say the legitimate, you know, uh, well, Rousseau would say, no, 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 Rousseau say. Anyway, so legitimate function of what we call the government is just to prevent violence. Now, I mean, Dr. Earl does that, but it turns out that because, um, at least according to her, because of the way he runs the institution, it's it doesn't take much at all to do that, right? She says like just a touch from him is enough to calm him down. <laughs> it just he just has to remind them. <laughs> so I mean, I, like I don't know if I believe that or if that would work for all mentally ill people. I presumably not, but in any case. That's that's what she's saying, and if you apply the same thought back to the nation, it seems like she's suggesting that you know, um, if the proper function of government, namely the concentration of the nation into a national idea and a national literature that expresses it, was being carried out properly, um, the part about avoiding violence would be easy. <laughs> Um, well, I've already gone over time. Uh, there were a few other things I wanted to talk about, but not much. So, okay. Sorry, I didn't notice. See you next week.